The Bible teaches the importance of faith in becoming a child of God. Paul writes in Romans chapter 5 and verse 1, Therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. He writes to the Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8, For by grace are you saved through faith. In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6, the writer says that without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And as you continue reading through that chapter, we come to a clear understanding that the kind of faith necessary to become a child of God is an obedient faith. The faith that leads us to do what he instructs us to do in his word. But even when one obeys the gospel, after we become Christians, faith is still so absolutely essential in living for the Lord. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7, For we walk by faith and not by sight. James, in the second chapter of the book that bears his name, wrote the importance of faith coupled with works and both of them are equally necessary in order to be well-pleasing unto God. And so we have clear teachings from the Word of God. One of the things that would be so helpful to us to strengthen our faith, obviously, would be to go to the Scriptures. We even have songs that have been penned by men designed to strengthen our faith and to help us to increase our faith and to know that it is through an obedient faith that true victory in Christ is found. And yet at the same time, as we study from the Word of God, you, go, you can go back to the Old Testament and the New and find that there have been great, great men of God, great servants of God, who have had doubts in their minds from time to time. Moses, when he was standing before God in, in the burning bush, even questioned his ability to go and to lead the Israelite people out of bondage. And so we also have others who also had a problem when it came to their strength of faith, and they needed assurance. They needed reassurance. Even the Apostle Paul, as strong as he was, understood that everything that he was able to do, everything that he was able to accomplish for the cause of Christ was by the grace of God, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 10, and not by his own ability. Sometimes we do have doubts in our life. Even Job, back in the Old Testament, uh, and he certainly is an example of a great faith in God, but as time went on, even he began to have doubts, and he understood his own integrity and began to question God about that. Why is this happening to me? And then around chapter 40, God speaks to him out of the whirlwind and lets him know that whatever circumstances in life that he faced, God was in control. God was still on the throne. And Job needed to maintain a strong faith in Almighty God. We have an example in the New Testament of one who was a faithful servant of God a great servant of God, and yet there was one occasion in which he also began to have doubts. I'm speaking of John the baptizer, John the forerunner of Christ. He did a great work. He did a great work in preparing the Jewish people for the coming of the Messiah, even to the point of on one occasion in John chapter 1, as Jesus was nearby, John pointed to him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Well, as time went on through John's ministry, he preached the gospel of the kingdom to the people. And he stood for truth in every circumstance. And no matter what danger he may have faced to his own life, he still stood for truth and right. And on one occasion, as he was speaking to Herod, he let Herod know in no uncertain terms that it was not lawful for him to have the woman that he was living with, that he was not scripturally married to her. Of course, she did not appreciate that. And through 
uh, through conniving and through, uh, through her efforts to try and have John, uh, have John killed. She eventually had him put in prison, which shortly after that he was beheaded. But when John was in prison, we see that he began to have doubts. Our text this evening for the next few moments will be the 11th chapter of the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 11, beginning with verse 1. And it came to pass, when Jesus had made an end of commanding his twelve disciples, he departed thence to teach and to preach in their cities. Now when John had heard in the prison, note, John is here in the prison. When he heard of the works of Christ, then he began to have some doubts, and he sent his disciples to make an inquiry. I want us to think for the next few moments about some lessons that we learn from this account, and we'll look at it in greater detail. First of all, when you have doubts, do something. When you have doubts, do something. We're going to see in the text that John's doubts had to do with whether or not Jesus was really the Christ. Now, keep in mind, this is the same one who earlier had said in pointing to Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. There's no doubt whatsoever that his faith was strong and he knew beyond the shadow of any doubt that Jesus was in fact the divine son of the living God. He knew that. He had faith in that fact and now he's there in prison. His death is going to take place just a short time thereafter. And so at this point, he's in the valley of despair. Is Jesus really the one? Well, the first thing that he did then was he acted. All right. He sent two of his disciples in Matthew 11 and verse 2. When John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples. So you see, he did something when he was facing doubt. He did something. He was not content to allow himself to continue to doubt. He was not content to allow himself to remain in the mental state that he was in at that particular point in time. So in essence, what John was, what John was thinking was, I want to know. I want to know beyond the shadow of a doubt. And so he sent his two disciples. He wanted reassurance. If you look at another instance in the earthly ministry of Jesus in Mark chapter 9, there was a man who brought his son to, uh, uh, to Jesus. And his son apparently had reached adult age. And his son was, was possessed with an, uh, with an evil spirit, a deaf and dumb spirit. And the man went on to explain to Jesus, Jesus that this spirit would, would throw him to the ground and that his son would foam at the mouth and the spirit, the evil spirit would throw him into the fire and into the water and would do everything that he could to destroy his son. Well, when this man then brought his son to Jesus, it's very clear that he had some doubts. We know that from the text. Now, obviously, one of the things that created doubt in his mind was that he had earlier asked the Lord's disciples to cast the unclean spirit out of his son. Now you read the text and they tried. They tried to do just that, but they couldn't do it. They couldn't do it. And so the man tells Jesus about this. And the man goes on to say, if you can, if you will, if you can, you can cast him out. You can, you can cleanse him, as it were. And Jesus goes on to tell him that all things are possible to him that believeth. And this is what the man said at this time. He said, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. Now, there's no contradiction here. When he said, Lord, I believe, he had a degree of faith. He didn't have the sufficient faith that he needed. He had not reached the degree of faith that he needed to have, but he did have some faith. So he said, Lord, I believe. 
And then his request to Jesus was, help my unbelief. And Jesus fulfilled his request. Jesus commanded the unclean spirit to depart out of his son and to never enter into him again. And of course, obviously, the evil spirit was obliged to obey the Son of God. And he left the young man at that particular point. So there was a man who had some doubt, and the Lord erased that doubt. There was another occasion in Luke chapter 24 where Jesus erased the doubts of some of his disciples. In Luke 24, starting with about verse 18, some of the women that had been to the tomb of Christ were, were walking along, and they met Jesus, but they didn't know who he was. And so Jesus asked them about what they were talking about. And so one of the women, Cleopas, asked the Lord, Have you not heard what has been taking place in Jerusalem? Have you not heard? And Jesus said, What? What things are taking place? And then she replied, and she said about Jesus of Nazareth, a man mighty in word and deed before God. And she went on to tell him that the chief priest had taken him and crucified him. And they went on to tell the Lord that they had been to the tomb and did not find his body. And then the Lord finally revealed himself to them and beginning with Moses and the prophets, expounded unto them all things in the scriptures that were written concerning him. The Lord erased their doubts. The point here is that Jesus can do it. The Lord has the power to erase whatever doubts we may have. And there's so many different things that could take place in our lives that could create doubt and uncertainty. We face trial. We face difficulties in life. And it's certainly nothing that is new because to, the, to his disciples, Jesus said in John 16, in the world you'll have tribulation. You'll have problems. In the world you'll have difficulties. But be a good cheer. I have overcome the world. And so whatever it is in life, Jesus can erase those doubts. When you have doubts, in the second place, don't give up on everything. Don't give up on everything. Look at Matthew 11 and verse 3. Now John sent two of his disciples to Jesus, and his disciples said, Art thou, this was John's question, Art thou he that should come? Look at the next part now. Or do we look for another? That second phrase, the last part of that verse, <coughs> tells us, John still believed. He still had faith that the Messiah, word meaning anointed, God's anointed, was going to come. He still had faith that the Old Testament scriptures were, in fact, going to be fulfilled. So even though he had doubt at this particular point with everything that was happening to him, and again, very shortly, he was going to... Uh, uh, he himself was going to die. He was going to be beheaded. He didn't give up on everything. He believed in the Old Testament scriptures. He did not abandon his faith. And sometimes, again, we have doubts. But we need to strive to maintain the faith that we have in God. We're assured of the power of prayer and the word of God. Paul says, be anxious for nothing, but, in pr but by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6. James writes in James chapter 5 and verse 16, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. It is of great benefit. Benefit to whom? Benefit to the righteous man. The one who goes to God in prayer, believing that God is going to answer that prayer. That's reassuring. And it's encouraging. So even where John was concerned at this particular point, when doubt was plaguing his mind, he didn't give up on everything. But then finally, when you have doubts, 
Be content with the evidence. When you have doubts, be content with the evidence. Look at the text again, verses 4 and 5. Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which ye do see and hear, which ye do hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk, and the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Well, that was a fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 29, verses 17 through 19, and Isaiah chapter 61 and verse 1. But I want you to notice something here. And this point, remember, is to be content with the evidence. When John sent his disciples to the Lord with the question that John had, are you he that should come? It's another way of asking, are you the Messiah? Or do we look for another? Let me tell you something. John, or Jesus rather, could have answered this way. He could have said, I am he. And that would have been truthful, wouldn't it? And that should have been sufficient even with John. But Jesus didn't do that. He didn't reply in that way. He gave the disciples of John evidence to take back to John. And so again, he says, go back to John and tell him what you see. Tell him what you're hearing. Tell him about the fact that the blind are receiving their sight. The lame are walking. The lepers are cleansed. The deaf are hearing. The dead are raised up. And the poor have the gospel preached to them. Tell John what you see and hear. Give John the evidence. And you see, when they did that, then John would be able to make up his own mind and draw his own conclusions based upon the Old Testament scriptures. Because if, in fact, his disciples went back and told him these things, then immediately John would know the scriptures are fulfilled in Jesus. He is the one. There was another time that Jesus offered evidence to his disciples. He appeared to them after his resurrection in the upper room, and they were astonished, even terrified, because they thought they were seeing a ghost, a spirit. And then Jesus asked them the question in Luke 24, in verse 38, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? And then listen to him. He said, look at me and see that it is I myself. He said, a spirit doesn't have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And then Luke says he showed them his hands and his feet. They would be able to look at his hands and see the nail prints. They would be able to look at his feet and see the nail prints. Evidence was offered to them. What did that evidence do for them? It strengthened their faith. It erased doubts in their mind. And in John's account, in John chapter 20, as Thomas is now with them, and this is eight days following his resurrection, this is the next Sunday evening, he appears to them there, Thomas is there in the room. Thomas had earlier said, I'm not going to believe unless I can see the evidence. Unless I can see the nail prints in his hand, the hole in his side, I'll not believe. And so Jesus shows him the evidence in John 20. And then Thomas said, my Lord and my God. That erased any doubt that Thomas had. 
sometimes answers to difficulties that we face in life are not, uh, are not easily found. And sometimes there simply are no answers, no clear answers. But in Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 5, the wise man said, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. Sometimes when there are no clear answers, you still have to trust in God. Put your faith, your trust in Him, knowing that whatever is happening in life, that the Lord will see you through. You see, He does not abandon His people. He does not abandon the faithful. In the words of the Hebrew writer, in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 6, the Lord said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. And you can take that to the bank. You can count on it. There may be someone here who's not a child of God. And if so, then we encourage you to to obey the gospel plan of salvation. Peter instructed those on Pentecost in Acts 2 and verse 38, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. So if you're not a Christian, then you need to do that. If you have obeyed but you've fallen away, maybe your faith is not as strong as it needs to be and maybe there are doubts in your mind. Maybe it's something that you need to Simply take to the Lord in prayer and ask him or request of him the same thing that the father of, of that demoniac did. Lord, help my unbelief. <clears throat> Strengthen my faith. Trust in God. Trust in his word. And be faithful to him in every aspect of life. If you're in any way